Hello, hello, everyone. We have been covering idols of the heart, learning to long for God alone. And we are now in chapter six of idols of the heart, knowing your heart. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. Deuteronomy 5, 29. Father God, we thank you on today for another opportunity to study your word, to come before you, Father God, and to just study your word and to learn more about you, to gain a better understanding and perspective of you and about you, Father God, to just grow closer in your word, Father God. We ask that you would bless your word, provide us with wisdom, knowledge, Father God, and even be a beacon of hope to others, Father God not only being hearers of your word, but doers of your word as well. We thank you all today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Unlike the immoral woman of name, Rahab the harlot had never heard from her neighbors about the God of Israel. All she had known was idolatry and prostitution. She lived among the doomed people, a people from whom God had pronounced judgment. Rahab's home was conducive to her trade. There, on the wall of Jericho, she could see travelers who might be interested in a comfortable night's nice rest. From these travelers, she had probably heard that the people known as the sons of Israel were headed her way. All her life, she had heard the stories about how the Egyptian army had drowned in the Red Sea. She had heard what happened to the kings of the Amorites who had been utterly destroyed, Joshua 2.10. And now, these seemingly invincible people were, were headed towards her city. As she entertained the Israeli spies, perhaps she thought she might be able to exchange her life for favors, but these men were different. They weren't interested in her gifts. They seemed honest and devout. As she interacted with the spies, she made a seemingly illogical choice. She chose to ally herself with them. Now this choice was illogical because Jericho was a strongly fortified city on a hill. With inner and outer walls, 18 feet thick. It had stood for years against attack. But Rahab, this idolatrous harlot, believed that her highest good lay in aid in her enemy scouts. Now consider the astonishing statement that Rahab made to the spies. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath, Joshua 2, 9 and verse 11. Now, how does she know that the Lord had given them the land? Well, perhaps you might reason. She was just hedging her bets. Perhaps she didn't know, but thought it would be good to protect herself just in case. Now, if that were true, why would she risk her life and lie when questioned about the men? How did she know the Israelite God was the true God? We don't know the answer to those questions or these questions, but we do know that God had revealed himself to her heart in some way. Rahab's history is one of the most delightful and amazing in the Bible. Without anything to recommend her, in fact, with everything to censor her, she became a favorite woman. Rahab's story doesn't end with harboring the spies and escaping from Jericho. She eventually married Salmon, a leading Israelite, and became the mother of Boaz. Boaz married Ruth, and they gave birth to Obed, the father of Jesse. This man was David's father, through whose family Jesus was born. Now, every Christian woman who has a checkered past can rejoice in the story of Rahab. We can be confident that God chose her out of her doomed city, protected her, and ensured her safe escape when chaos reigned around her. Not only did God protect and deliver her, but he also delivered her family with her. What a blessed story. God taught her what she needed to know. He taught her that it was her highest good to hide the spies. He delivered her and gave her a family and a place of honor among all the women of faith in the world. See, she is one of only two women listed in the heroes of faith. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace 
Hebrews 11, 31. See, Rahab knew of God's conquering power because he had already informed her mind, conquered her heart, and birthed faith in her. Now, this faith made her aware of his will and obedient to it. If God can so move on a harlot's heart and give her faith, he can work in you too. He can instruct your heart and cause you to understand and desire truth. In the previous chapters, we've seen how choices we make are based on estimates of our best chance for happiness. Now, if you've been following this channel, you will know that we've been covering the previous chapters. We have started at chapter one in this book of Idols of the Heart and Learning to Long for God. Now, we've been encouraged to recognize there is no happiness better than knowing God's unfailing love. Now, as we discuss the process of choice, perhaps you were curious about your ability to discern between true and false promises of happiness. And hopefully you've done the for far the thought questions so that you have a better understanding or a clearer understanding. Now, you might have wondered how you could grow in your love for God and desire to pursue true joy. Now, after all, those mud pies C.S. Lewis wrote about seem appealing, don't they? Remember, we talked about the mud pies. Now, in the next few chapters, we're going to take a deep look at the functioning of our heart. See, we'll see how wholehearted devotion can be developed. Remember that when Jesus gave the foremost commandment, he said that our whole heart, soul, and mind must be enraptured with God. When he said this, what did he mean? What was his understanding of the heart? See, understanding the heart, the mind, the affections, and the will. When Jesus spoke of the heart, he was talking about the inner you. When the Bible refers to the heart, it means the three main operations of the inner you. The inner you, the inner me, the inner others. See, your mind, affections, and will. See, the mind. The term heart refers to your mind, which includes your thoughts, beliefs, understandings, memories, judgments, conscience, and discernment. Consider the following verses that illustrate this point. And understand with their heart and return, I would heal them. Matthew 13, 15. For even though they knew God, their foolish heart was darkened. Romans 1, 21. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Mark 2, 6. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Luke 24, 38. I have given you a wise and discerning heart. 1 Kings 3, 12. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. Now, as you can see, the Bible uses the word heart to speak about your ability to think, understand, doubt, reason, discern, and remember. This is different from the way we Westerners think of the term heart. We usually refer to these kinds of activities as being outside the heart, solely in the mind. But biblically speaking, the mind is just one of three areas of operation of the heart or inner person. Let's look at the affections. See, another part of our inner person or heart is what the Puritans would call affections. Our affections include our longings, desires, feelings, imaginations, and emotions. This word is used in the way that we would normally use the word heart in our culture. When we say that we have a broken heart, we usually don't mean that our thinking is damaged or that our physical heart isn't functioning properly. What we usually mean is our feelings and longings are pained. The Bible presents a broader view of the heart, of which our feelings and desires are one function. Briefly, here is how the Bible refers to this area of our inner person. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. Psalms 24. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry. Ecclesiastics 7.9. Serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart. Deuteronomy 28.47. Why do you weep? Why is your heart sad? 1 Samuel 1, 8. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Isaiah 35, 4. The heart of the people melt with fear. Joshua 
14, 8. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, James 3, 14, follow the impulses of your heart, Ecclesiastics 11, 9. The imaginations of your heart run riot, Psalm 73, 7. For consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart, Hebrews 12, 3. Now, as you can see, the Bible speaks of your heart as being the seat of your emotions, imaginations, longings, and desires. For our discussion, we'll use the Puritan's word, affections. When we talk about this aspect of our inner person because we want to consider more than just the emotions, it is particularly important for us to understand our affections because they are influential in worship. And then the will. The third way that our heart functions is the will. The will is the part of the inner person that chooses, to de chooses or determines what actions we take. The will is informed by the mind and the affections about the best course of action. And then the will acts upon it. Choose life in order that you may live. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Joshua 24, 15. He will eat curds and honey at the time. He knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Isaiah 7:15. You shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped. He shall live in the place which he shall choose where it pleases him. Deuteronomy 23, 15 through 16. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. Psalms 25, 12. See, the mind, thoughts, beliefs, understanding, memory, judgment, discernment, the conscious. See, this is a biblical portrait of the heart. Affections, longings, desires, feelings, imagination, emotions. And then the will chooses and determines actions. So if you've never thought about your heart in this way before, perhaps this is a little confusing. Just remember that biblically speaking, your heart functions in three different ways, the mind, the affections, and the will. So rather than thinking about these three aspects, your mind, affections, and will, as being separate and isolated from each other, Think of them as continually working in conjunction with each other. Now, look back at Isaiah 7, 15. Go back to Deuteronomy 23, 15, 16, and Psalms 25, 12 for examples of this. See, it is difficult to, to differentiate between them in our day-to-day -day lives. Think of them as you might think of your brain, your heart, and your lungs. As you're sitting here, and we're discussing this book, you aren't aware of what part of your body is working to keep you alive. That's because every part is working together. It is true that if one part stopped working, you become aware of it pretty quickly. In normal circumstances, though, it's not something we think about. Most of the time, we, we just don't think about it. We might even take it for granted. But in one sense, that's how our mind, affections, and will operate. Your mind should inform your affections of the source of your highest happiness. Your affections imagine it, cause you, cause you to long for it, and apply the impetus needed to awaken your will to choose. See, no one sits around thinking about whether it's his affection, mind, or will that caused him to choose vanilla over chocolate ice cream. We just do it. But in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, in Hebrews, all three of the aspects of the heart's functions are referred to in one passage about Moses. Let's see if we can pick these things out. Hmm. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ's greatest riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. Now, let's look again at this verse. Hmm. Do you see how Moses' mind, affections, and will each interacted with his faith? He might, he might have thought about it, but his mind regarded or considered disgrace as a greater happiness than the treasures of Egypt. His affections longed for the happiness that his mind judged would have greater value than the pleasures of sin. His imagination looked ahead and saw the reward that would be his. 
His mind informed his affections that this reward would bring him greater happiness than anything Egypt had to offer. See, Moses thought, felt, desired, and acted on his belief that disgrace from Christ would bring him greater happiness than pleasures in Pharaoh's house. And finally, his will was moved, and he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses believed that disgrace and deprivation for the sake of God's loving kindness was better than a life of pleasure and power. As you can see, Moses' heart, the mind, emotions, and will acted together, directing his worship by discerning, desiring, and choosing which God he would serve. He saw that there would be greater happiness in suffering for the living God than in a life of ease in Pharaoh's palace. Now, when God eventually gave him the law on Mount Sinai, he had already decided that Jehovah would be his God. Now, I don't know about you, but you might need to make a decision on today. And maybe, just maybe, as we cover these lessons in Idols of the Heart, learning to long for God alone just might help you along the way. And then we have See, we have a heart disease. All of us have a heart disease. Well, you might be thinking, if I could just direct my thinking toward God, learn to desire him, and then choose him, I'd be okay, right? Well, yes and no. Yes, it is true. God calls us to learn and embrace the truth with our mind. He calls us to desire and long for him with our affections. Yes, he does. And he commands us to choose him with our will. Yeah, he does. He does hold us responsible in each of these ways. But we have a problem, don't we? See, without God's aid, we'll never understand, desire, or choose him. See, we need God in our life. We can't do it alone. And see, the truth is reflected in Augustine's prayer. Give what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. See, we can't accomplish this heart change on our own. We need his power to teach incline and direct our hearts to him so yes as you present your heart to him for surgery as you present your heart to him for surgery he will graciously cause you to grow in love for him see we need a surgery of the heart and we can't do it alone just like if you had a physical surgery of the heart sometimes you have to take pills the rest of your life, or some people get a pacemaker to help their heart along the way. See, we have a major heart problem against which we will have to struggle our entire lives, and we need God to help us with our heart problem. Amen, somebody? And see, there will never come a time when our heart will be completely conformed to loving and worshiping him, at least not on this side of heaven. See, Jeremiah spoke thus about our heart's disease because we all got a heart disease. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. See, we got a fake heart and a false heart and uh, it tricks or deceives us into thinking that our desires are pure, that what we want is because we want it and it's good and God approves. Mm. But every man's way seems right in his own eyes, right? But in the end, it's the ways of death, right? Our heart trouble is hereditary. It had its origin at the fall. You remember Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man. You know, ever since Adam, all people have had this problem. We all have a sin nature, as the Bible teaches. And if you believe you don't have a sin nature, then you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Yes, I said it, and some folks is going to be uncomfortable, but it's the truth. See, God will show us who we are in our naked selves. He will show us. And, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5 and Genesis 8, 21. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalms 51, 5. And the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Ecclesiastics 9, 3. And for out of the heart come evil thoughts. Matthew 
15, 19. See, as you can see, the heart of the inner man is full of evil and deception. Jesus taught it is the fountain from which all of our sinful thoughts, words, and deeds flow. Even though believers have been given a new heart, so our thoughts and desires are changed. We will struggle with the remnants of our old nature. And see, we must continually battle the competing loves in our heart. And all of us got some competing battles of loves in our heart. And every day we have to choose whom we will love the most. Will it be God or ourselves? Will it be the things we want to go buy or God that we know we shouldn't be buying? See, there are some things we shouldn't have spent money on, but we put that before God. Are we going to be st good stewards of God's money? Or are we going to be reckless with God's money? Are we going to go to that club that we know we shouldn't be going to? Are we going to go to that concert that we know we shouldn't be over there listening to that bad music that's being played? There are so many things that we put before God hmm, because of ourselves and the gods we create. You know, those thoughts and images in our mind, we create them things. And then we act upon those things. See, the difficulty of these choices is compounded because our hearts deceive us into thinking that acting in some sinful way is the best or perhaps the godliest course of action. Our hearts deceive us. Well, but let's look at it from this place. Let me illustrate something for you this way. You know, when the Pharisees spearheaded the movement to crucify Christ, you remember that, they thought they were doing God a favor. See, all, although the New Testament teaches that it was because of envy that the Jews turned Jesus over to Pilate, Matthew 27, 18, they thought they were doing a service to God. See, these men weren't blasé about sin, you know. They were so concerned about it that they refused to enter Pilate's praetorium, John 18, 28, so that they might not be defiled during the Passover. All the while, mm, they were committing the most heinous sin of all time, arranging for the death of the Son of God. See, our hearts can be terribly deceived. And you may be willing to admit that you've been deceived by maybe a, a man or a, or a woman or your spouse or children or a good friend or a co-worker or people in the church. You may be willing to admit it. And then again, you might be ashamed that you've been deceived. And there may be some people on social media that have been deceiving people. And you might have got caught up in that deception. But now you see it for what it really is. See, the Pharisees would have been shocked to discover, yeah, they were idolaters. See, because they love respectful things and respectful greetings and seats of honor more than they love God. See, those were the things that they put before God. And their wicked hearts were particularly prone to deception because they had another God. They respected men. And see, God is no respecter of persons. But they respected men. They had a respect of men. And they loved that more than anything. And loving anything more than God is idolatry. And idolatry always breeds a deceived heart. Because when you are breeding idolatry, you will do anything, anything to get those desires fulfilled. That breeds a deceived heart. When you make money your God, success your God, being revelant your God, seeking attention your God, When you put all those things before God, you, breed, you are breeding a deceived heart. And see, Apostle, the Apostle Paul, Paul, he experienced heart trouble. We all at some time have experienced heart trouble. 
And I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about this heart here. Romans 7, he declared that the joyful concurrent with the law of God in the inner man, this inner heart, this inner man, the, the, the inner man, our heart, you know, inside of us. That's the heart trouble that we have been experiencing. That heart trouble that, that, uh, that, you know, we see that there is within us another force. You know, we concur with the law of God on the inner side, the inner man, the inner woman. But then we, most of us know, if we are believers and we've been studying the word, most of us know that there is within us another force and that this force wage war against the truth. And that's what happened to Paul. The force wage war against the truth he had embraced with his heart. And he anguished over his false desires. See, a lot of us are like Paul. A lot of us are like Paul. And we should be anguished over our false desires of the heart. Because all of us have them. All of us have them. And on the other hand, he sought after God. And on the other, he went after sin. We're like Paul. Because we will seek after God. And on the other hand, we'll just seek after sin and say, you know what? I'll just ask for forgiveness later. I, I, I'll just take care of that later. When God told us to do something, you know, I'll just do it later. Well, you know, I get paid next week, so I'll just spend this money right now. When you know that that money is not to be spent. Well, you know, I got an extra check coming. I just pay my tithes, you know, with that extra check. Instead of being a good steward of God's money. See, we seek after God. And we'll talk about God. We'll read about God in the word and study and, and quote scriptures and and then something to be put in front of us, that extra force, that other force that's waging war within us. And we start, that's where we start to experience that heart trouble. And then we'll go after sin. See, Paul struggled because like us, like you and me, us, he had a sinful nature. And a deceived heart. Yes, a deceived heart. Yep. For real, y'all. Our deceived heart. Not just Paul's, but ours. And it continually whispered to him, like it continually whispers to us, about sin's goodness and the joys to be found in disobedience. Folks find joy in disobedience. Hmm. I'd rather go and do that and be disobedient because that's where I find my joy. Knowing darn well that you know better. And see, in Paul's distress, and even in our distress, we ought to cry out, but in Paul's great distress he cries out wretched man that i am who will set me free from the body of this death and his answer was in romans 7 24 through 25 thanks be to god through jesus christ our lord romans 7 24 through 25 See, if we say that we don't suffer from a heart disease or we haven't experienced heart trouble, then we are lying and the truth is not in us. Because a lot of us, many of us are like Paul, suffering 
from a heart disease and heart trouble because we're concurrent with the inner man, with the law of God in the inner man. But there's another force. See, the God who knows the real you, he knows us inside and out. He knows us, not just the real you, but the real me. When we stand in the mirror and we get all dressed and dolled up and we want to take selfies of ourselves with our mobile devices and apps and cameras. And we're all dolled up with beautiful clothes and attire and and accessories and makeup and our hair is done or we have a wig or weave on. But God still knows the real you, the real me. And we got to strip ourselves of all of that to see what God is trying to tell us. Because see, well, you might be thinking, if my heart is so deceitful, why should I bother struggling against idolatry? Well, see, this answer I'm going to give you, it, it might just be simplistic, too simple. But we should struggle against our sinful hearts because God commands us to. He commands us to do it. And how will, we, how will we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind if we don't combat the ways that we fail to do so? That's a question to ponder on. See, this struggle against the sin in our heart is precious because by it we learn what a great price the Lord Jesus has paid. He paid a significant ransom for us. And it is in this struggle that we will learn to trust him and to distrust ourselves, to hate sin and love holiness, to cultivate humility and to long for heaven. See, we can't trust ourselves. God has already shown us that. See, when we want to do good, we can't. When we want to up, walk upright, we fell at it. We say we're not going to go spend that extra money, but we do when we shouldn't have. Now, I'm not going to act the way you, God told me I shouldn't act that way. I'm not, Lord, I'm going to change. And we go and do the same thing. Lord, I want you to deliver me from these things, you know, X, Y, and Z things. Foul language. Not studying the Bible, make, doing everything else except for making time for the word and God. Not going to church regularly and consistently, going sparingly. Lord, I'm going to change. But then we don't. You know, that bad attitude. You know that we have and, and we don't cultivate humility. We're arrogant, we're haughty, you know, all that stuff. We can't trust ourselves, but we can trust God and we need help at it. And see, in the midst of all of this, we have to learn the joy of obedience and the happiness, happiness that is found only in loving God. Because all that other stuff, It doesn't help us. But when we seek the kingdom of God first and we search for his righteousness, everything else will be added. Because see, in the end, with all that stuff, God still knows the real you, the real me, the real us. And we can take refuge in the truth that your heavenly father completely understands your heart, even though your heart might deceive you, deceive you, deceive me. Our hearts isn't hidden to him. He knows our heart. He sees our heart.
For God sees not as man sees, for the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. 1 Chronicle 28, 9 and 2 Chronicle 6, 30. He knows the secrets of the heart. Psalms 44, 21 and Psalms 139, 2. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Jeremiah 17, 10. But Jesus knew that was in man. John 2, 24 through 25. Go read the whole scripture. And you, Lord, who knows the hearts of all men. Acts 1, 24. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Revelation 2, 23. See, he knows you. He knows me. He knows us. He knows how long. He knows how you long to love him. How you want to be pleasing to him. He know, also knows where you deceived and where you're being deceived. He knows when you're trying to kid him into thinking that you're okay. I'm good. I'm all right. When in fact you're not. We're dealing with heart trouble. We need a cleansing of our heart. We need a heart surgery. And only God can help us with that. We got a heart disease that we can't cure on our own. God knows that we're not good, but we'll say we're okay. He knows all the times when you do good works to impress others. When it's just for show, when it's just for notoriety, when it's just for attention. When it's just for people to think you're good and you, you're all that when you're not. He knows those things. He's aware of your apathy and when you worship other gods. He knows when you put other stuff before him. And when you say, I, I don't have time, but we see you out there making time for all the other stuff. God sees all that. He sees it. We see it. When you tell your loved ones, I don't have time, I'm this and that, but they see you out all the time. God sees it. We see it. We know. He knows you through and through. He knows us through and through. He knows me through and through. That's why Jesus told his disciples, I am the good shepherd and I know my own. Jesus knows his sheep. John 10, 14. See, the word diagnosis is your heart's condition. The word does that. Although our hearts are unknowable without his aid, God has given us a tool to use as we seek to develop wholehearted worship, the word of God. See, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. The word of God discerns even the most hidden thoughts and designs of the heart. It will discover to men the variety of their thoughts and purposes. Only the Holy Spirit, as he works in union with his word, can reveal our thoughts and intentions. And as we read, meditate on, study and hear preaching of the word, we're able to get a glimpse of our inner self. As I've studied, as you've studied, maybe you've been enlightened about your true thoughts, your desires and choices, because I know I have. Wow, I thought, that's me. How many of you have thought that that's me? That's you. No ordinary book, trained therapist or close friend can do this for you. No, they can't. They might think they can. A psychic might tell you some stuff that God has already shown you and you chose to ignore it and then you want to run to a psychic or a tarot reader and tell you what God has already shown you and told you. See, nothing can illumine your understanding to who you are except the word of God. God has given you the word so that you can grow in your knowledge of yourself and develop true worship 
of him. See, studying the word don't cost you any money. It costs you time, but not money. See, God will never charge you to study his word. Now, you can go out and purchase books and all of that. Yes, but God will never charge you to study the word of God in the Bible. Whatever translation you choose, but God will never charge you to study the word of God. See, psychics and tarot readers study you to tell you about yourself. But God don't need to charge you to tell you about yourself because he already know you. He created you. He already know you. See, you and I, not just you, not just me, but you and I will always struggle with knowing our heart. You know, because see, the more we give ourselves to know, believe, and obey the word, the more self-understanding we'll have. But we'll never see ourselves or God perfectly. We will always struggle. But the more we give ourselves, the more we will have a more understanding, self-understanding. Because the more we give to ourselves to know, believe, and obey the word. And that's how we get a better self-understanding. And see, for now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face, now I know in part. But then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. See, God, the more we study his word, the more God shows us who we are. The more the, our diagnosis of our heart condition are revealed. Hmm. See, there will come a day when we'll know ourselves because we see him in all his beauty. But until then, we'll have to be content with clouded, dim in images and pray for hearts that are willing, though lame. Yes, I said it. Some willing hearts that are lame. We can pray with Bernard. Draw me, however unwilling to, to make me willing. Draw me slow footed to make me run. Hmm. The heart, as it's defined in scripture, is amazingly complex. Yes, our heart is complex. Yes, the people's heart is complex. And see, let me tell you something. It's much more than Valentine cards and lace darlings. It's much more than chocolates. It's much more than a dinner date. It's much more than a gift. It's much more than a brand new car with a red bow on it. It's much more than diamond earrings or a new ring or anniversary ring or engagement ring. It's much more than those things, my brothers and sisters, or a new pair of shoes or a new dress or a new hat or a new purse. It's much more than those things. See, Valentine's Day, it is, comes once a year in February on the 14th of February every year. It's one day that the world, that man determines that you should display love towards a loved one. Those are the standards of the world, my brothers and sisters. But God calls us to love one another. That means we ought to love one another daily, every day and daily. Not just one day. See, man's standards want you to believe that it's an awesome thing and it's exciting on February the 14th. They even got people deceived, especially women, that if they don't get a gift on Valentine's Day from their loved ones, then they're nothing and they're undervalued and, and they don't mean nothing and they're irrelevant and they have a broken heart or broken spirit because their loved one didn't show them what they thought they should have on Valentine's Day. But my brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that love is every single day of the year and if someone don't love you throughout the year, why would you want a gift from somebody and is only going to show you love one day of the year if they don't love you all day, all year long. Because at the end of the day, that gift means nothing. It's false. It's phony. Just like our heart is false. 
our, our hearts have been deceived. We're like a Paul that struggles. And I don't want a gift from somebody that can't love me and show me respect and honor throughout the year. I'm keeping it real, my sisters and brothers. Some people may not agree with me, but I'm keeping it real. And if you read the word and you understand the word and study it, then you will know what I'm talking about. And I know there's many people that understand that. Who wants to be only loved on one day? And the rest of the year, they're treating you bad. They're disrespectful. They're, they're disregarding your feelings and who you are. They make you feel irreverent and make you feel this small like you don't matter. They try to shut you up like you don't have a voice I don't want a gift from somebody like that that don't appreciate me throughout the year I'm thankful that God loves me daily every single day in spite of who I am see that's good news my brothers and sisters he knows who we are and he still loves us and he knows that we're gonna struggle he knows that we struggle. He knows our heart. And he knows the real us. And he knows we're going to struggle. But God is an understanding God. And he knows that we're not perfect. And we'll never see ourselves or God perfectly. But there will come a day. See, it's wellspring of everything that you are. Your aspirations, your desires, your loves. And although it is barely known by you, even with the Spirit's illumination, it's completely understood by God. See, the scarlet thread. We don't know exactly when or how the Lord worked in Rahab's heart. We don't know that. But when the spies told her to tie a cord of scarlet thread in the window for her safety, it is possible that they were remembering the blood that had been applied to the lintel and side posts of their parents' homes in Egypt. Just as the blood protected the Israelites from destruction, this red cord would preserve her from the coming judgment. As you struggle, as we struggle with the competing loves in our heart, you can remember the scarlet thread of Christ's blood applied to your heart as well. Not just your heart, but my heart. See, there will be times of war as we wrestle with our idolatry. But you needn't worry about your ultimate, ultimate safety. God has promised that he will complete his work in you and deliver you safely to his eternal kingdom. Let it be a scarlet line that you tie in the wind, namely an avowal of true faith in his precious blood. It is a high privilege to dwell peacefully and quietly in the finished work of Christ and in the sure immutable promise of God who cannot lie. God is a man that, that cannot lie. See, why fret ye sell yourselves? Why fret? Why fret ye yourselves? And go about with a thousand anxieties when salvation's work was finished on the accursed tree and Christ has gone into the glory and has carried on his perfect work before his father's face. Why should we continue to fret? So you see. In the same way God informed, enlightened, and conquered Rahab's heart, he can inform, enlighten, and conquer ours. Mine, yours, ours. He can bring you to the immeasurable peace and joy that flows out to all the world from the sacred blood that was shed. That was shed now we're done with the bible study lesson now for further thought how does the story of rahab encourage you question number two 
What does the story of Moses prove about God's ability to work in our hearts? Number three, from your studies, how would you define the heart? How has your perception of it changed? Number four, Jeremiah taught that the heart was deceitful and wicked. What does that mean? And five, can you think of a specific time when you were convinced that a certain course of action was right only to find out later that you were mistaken? How can something like that happen? And then question number six, what does the truth that God is the heart nor mean to you? And how does it comfort you? you. So with that being said, you all, these are the for for the thought questions. Don't forget to study and do the questions. And if you need to go back to the video, go ahead, replay the video. This is an awesome book, Learning to Long for God Alone, Idols of the Heart. And there are some things in here that even I become uncomfortable about because I know that God is working through me and I pray that you are thankful that God is working through you by following along with this Bible study. So share it with someone. Share this video with someone. Share this video with someone. Because someone may need to know about their idols also. Someone may want a closer walk with Christ. And with that being said, share the video. Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're not a subscriber. And don't forget to continue to follow the Stand Up Be Counted channel because we are reading Destined for the Throne and we're also in Refresh Your Prayers. And because it's Black History Month, we are covering Christian women in history. And it's actually African American Christian women in history. So don't forget to follow me, hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification for all. That way you will get everything that drops. There is quite a bit of different videos on this channel that may pique your interest. And with that being said, you all, God bless you and have a beautiful day. Bye!